prepare. If you have letters or photos, please make copies of the original. I always tell parents because we don't know how the child's going to react in the moment. They may look at the picture and then rip it up. And you're like, that's the only picture I have, right? Make copies for the child so they have something authentic and let them keep it. If you have baby items, blankets, dolls, baby bracelets, let the child see, touch, and explore them and keep them safe in a safe space to be preserved. Some kids are ready to see and some kids are not, but you'll have it. Parents sometimes, I don't know where it's, it is. It's in some box. I'm like, well, you're not ready. You're not ready to tell this story that. You got to get organized because you want to be. Because I'm going to tell you something. I was 17. And my parents gave me a Christmas card. We believe this came from your birth father. I'm like, why are you showing this to me now? I would have wanted to see this a long time ago. I was pretty upset. I'm surprised I didn't rip the card then because they knew I had been actively asking and asking. So it made me not trust them. Maybe go, oh, what else are you keeping from me? What else are you hiding from me? Have everything. It will help and be in your best interest as a parent. We want to create that foundation of trust. Write down their story, all that you know, and read it a few times. Include birth mother observations with the information of she cried when she held you. What does that tell a child? That little detail for a child, that's a big detail that a lot of families leave out. Even she kissed me, that's the good stuff. She even wanted to hold you one more time. They're a big deal. Do a rehearsal, practice answering those tough questions, like do a worst case scenario. She's going to ask this. All right, let's be prepared for that one. When the child is not at home, you want to practice with your spouse or partner or a social worker, therapist, and play out, or another parent, and play out different scenarios and answers, right? Okay. Know that if the child expresses worry over the birth mother, speculating that she is dead, reassure the child that the birth mother is probably healthy and safe. And you can say, we don't know, but let's hold in our hearts that she's well, and healthy, and safe. You can do that. You can hold something. It's the ambiguity, ambiguous loss that we're containing here. The not knowing and the wish, the want. Where's the balance in that? To say, I don't know. You don't know. That's the truth. That's knowing something. I don't know, but we're putting words to it. Let's put that in your question box, which I'm gonna to get to. It is also important to reassure the child that the birth mother will not attempt to reclaim the child if there is fear, a common fear of adopted children who were abused or who were not abused. Avoid saying she gave you away, not best practice. Most of the time, Children are separated from their family of origin because they were unable to keep them safe, either from harm or danger, keep food on the table, pay bills, or heal their addictions, not because the parent gave them away. Most of the time, there was an adoption plan that was made. There were court hearings. There were many decisions being made. Now, are there cases where there's abandonment? Yes. And I'm going to go into that because we're gonna talk about some difficult circumstances and how you explain that later. She loves you very much. Telling a child their birth mother chose adoption because she loved them can cause a child to come to the conclusion that if you love me very much too, will you give me away? Younger kids, before the age of seven, there's concrete thinking. So a flea market is, oh, there's fleas in it. Oh, she loved me very much. Oh, you love me very much. Oh, she gave me away. Oh, you're going to give me away. It's that concrete for kids. They don't have what's called abstract thinking yet. Avoid saying because you are special or chosen. This is a tough one. We want children to know that they're important and they matter. But telling a child this can be problematic. In most cases, children are not chosen. Having to be special places an incredible burden for a child who may worry they cannot live up to the expectation. Instead, put the emphasis on how unique and special it is for a family to be formed through adoption. How special adoption is, not how special you are. Not, I don't mean to tell you things 
to scare you, but I do want to say that there was an adoptee and there's a film, it's one of the first documentary films made about adoption. And this Vietnamese adoptee was told how special he was. He was chosen, he was special. He had felt so much pressure to succeed that he actually ended up killing himself. He could not meet the expectations in his own mind. And you see him talking about this in the documentary film. It doesn't help, it hurts. They were poor. Although this may be true, it is best to not overemphasize this because if their current family were to encounter a financial crisis, the child may conclude they may go to another home to be adopted all over again. If this is the only answer, why reassure them over and over and over that financial problems would not cause any separation? A lot of children often conclude too, <laughs> this happens, well, if she was so poor, why couldn't you help her? Because you have money, so I could have stayed with them. It puts the parent in a terrible dilemma. Because then you start thinking, well, that's actually like, I mean, we talk about this in the field of adoption. Like, why are we not supporting more families staying together, right? Why are we not supporting mothers and children and putting money in that department, preserving that relationship, supporting mothering, not dismantling mothering. Avoid saying they were not good for you because they were bad. It is best not to depict the birth parents as bad people. Even if they are perceived as bad, the child will conclude that maybe they're bad too. If they were highly abusive, it is better and still true to simply say they were not able to handle being parents at that time. Let's just separate the person from the experience. So see if you can separate the parent and find something rather than their behavior, what they did to their child. Like I said before, your birth family brings such wonderful culture into your life. Okay. So this is one of my biggest interventions when helping families contain all the questions and provide organization. You need any empty box, crayons, markers, index cards, and stickers. So I tell kids, guess what? We're gonna make a question box. Why? Because we understand you probably have a lot of questions about a lot of different things. Why can't we have pizza for breakfast? Or why? Hmm. You're wondering, what happened to your birth family? We want to bring out the questions. Why am I in foster care? Kids don't have the language. They need our permission. They need to know from us it's okay. You're probably wondering what happened to your birth mom, but you need to be ready and prepared to do this for them. Do I have any brothers or sisters? Who is my daddy? Can I get a picture? What happened to my foster family? Is this my forever family? Can I write a letter to my foster family? Why couldn't they keep me? There's a lot of questions. I want to value this question box has a lot of merit. Let's decorate this question box. Anytime you have a question, we're gonna put the question in the question box. And guess what? Whenever I do this exercise, I tell kids and even teens, I'm gonna talk teen to teen. You know, you have a lot of questions. You can even use an envelope. We're just gonna write them down and put them in an envelope because we can only imagine how much you're carrying inside. We're only going to ask questions. And we're not going to give answers. You're going to then look at your questions and go, hmm, which one or two questions do you really want an answer to? We're going to timestamp that question, put the date and time, and you're going to get that answer a week from today because the big people are going to go do research now. And what does that do for you? It provides a stalling tactic. Why? Because kids will ask the darndest questions at the darndest time. And a parent's driving in the car. Hey, why couldn't mommy keep me? Why was mommy doing drugs or why? And then the parents like, ah, I don't know how to answer that question. And then they pull the car over and they either feel obligated because it's happening. Like, oh boy, it's really happening now. I need to answer. And then they give too much information. And then they're both flooded. How do we contain from no. there? It becomes, oh, you're driving in the car. Oh, how come mommy did drugs? 
That's a good question for the question box. We'll write that when we get home. <sighs> Pace yourself because these questions will come, especially with kids who have memories. They're going to be curious. And actually the stronger your attachment, the more you provide the accessibility, the more they're gonna ask and wonder and wanna make sense. And you're gonna wanna be there with them. When you come back a week later, if you have the answer, you provide it, you write it on a different card and then you make an answer box. And if you don't have the answer, we don't have the answer to this question at this time. We're gonna keep it in the question box for now until we know this provides the acknowledgement the mental health piece of containing this ambiguous loss. And it helps everyone in knowing and being curious about the same things together. Very effective tool for kids and parents.